so I'd like to begin with a breath, a breath for life. So if you'd like, you can join me. And um, so I'm just going to take a big breath in and let it out very slowly and do it again. One more time. And just letting it all go. Anything that's in my way, anything that's keeping me from being fully present, I let it go. And I'm going to light this candle here where I'm at in Madison, Wisconsin, to bring a light and my higher power more consciously into my awareness. So, um, so this is a, this is a big deal for me, as you can imagine. I'm grateful to everyone who entrusted me with this responsibility and this opportunity to share my experience, my strength, and my hope in this program. And it's good to see some familiar faces. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really nice to have the support um, because I was you know, going over this with my sponsor and uh, saying this is like really intense like, a, like if I was Catholic, it would be like one of the most intense confessions <laughs> that I've ever gone through and to do it publicly. Um, but this is how it works. This is what it's about. So I appreciate the safe space that we create for each other in order to do this very challenging and yet um, it's very courageous work. And I want to honor everyone who shows up into these meetings of the courage it takes just to get here. And we each have our own stories of what brought us into these rooms. And my story may be different from yours in some ways because it's my story. And yet I find that every time I listen to someone else, there's things about their story that resonate for me and help me know I'm not alone and that I can go on knowing that there's other women out there and other people out there who are doing the best they can with what they're given and trying to learn more so that that we so that I can set myself free of sex love and for me relationship addiction so I'm I'm gonna um, begin with a couple of things first I want to thank Alicia and then there's also my friend Ellen um, who got me into this <laughs> so I thank you both for making this possible and so that I can heal and so that I can help and support you in your healing. I want to say that I believe that there is an original wholeness, an unbreakable self inside each person, inside me. And reconnecting with my whole true self at my spiritual core gives me an awareness that I could never be stolen that I could never be given away, that I could never be lost. I felt that way, lost, stolen, and given away as a child and as a young adult. I felt that way because I was divided from my true self through loss and trauma and a lack of healthy love and attention. But now I give that love and attention to myself with the help of my higher power, I am becoming the love I have been seeking all my life. And I'd like to read from the page 15 of A State of Grace Daily Meditations to begin with. I had reached the point which is the prelude to change for most addicts. I was at my bottom. SLAA basic text, page two. 217. Why is it only by experiencing devastating pain that we begin to see clearly that change must come? Wouldn't it be more pleasant if we could simply act on the fleeting thought that perhaps this sexual encounter or this emotional intrigue 
could have disastrous results. Once we truly hit bottom, we are confronted with two choices. We either keep digging to self-destruction or we surrender. If we are able to surrender and fully accept our powerlessness, we are able to push ego and self-will out of the way and make room for our higher power. As we work each step in our recovery process, we begin to see we have choices. With help from our higher power, others in the program, our sponsor, and the steps, we begin to steer clear of our bottom line behavior and the pain of finding yet another deeper bottom. We find it difficult to go through this ego puncturing, but know that the alternative is worse. We may not survive another acting out episode. Today, I choose to use the tools of the program to help me stay free from the pain of my bottom line behaviors. And I thought that would be a good place to begin because it was, my, it was one of many bottoms that finally brought me into this program. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about my story of what got me here. Um, when I was eight years old, I had already experienced um, a lot of dysfunction in the family I was raised in. My parents were the pillars of society. They were loved by seemingly everyone and respected. Um, I was in the middle of seven children and my parents were leaders in their church. Inside our home was a different story. It was very chaotic and dysfunctional. My parents had a loving relationship that was also in some ways very, uh, very codependent, very uh, abusive in some ways, my father to my mother in some ways. And um, there was a lot of people, nine people in a house and everyone was pretty much alone, felt that way. And so I discovered um, pretty young and my father turned his abusive nature to me when I was five until I was 13 and turned it back on him. But I learned pretty young that love wasn't easy to get, but also that I really needed it. I really desperately wanted and needed it. So around eight years old, I um, started watching TV excessively, um, watching movies over and over again. Uh, I lived um, just outside of New York City, and uh, there was a million-dollar movie in those days, which would play every single night the same movie, and I would be there and watching these love stories because that's where I was getting my love. That's where I was learning about love. The love stories were often tragic. The love songs that I listened to were all full of longing and obsession. And that's how I started to learn about love. And by eight years old, I was already attached to tragic love, loss, heartbreak. They started to become my personal myths and my stories that I was writing for myself. And I was attracted to people who were inaccessible. That's the pattern I learned from my family. My parents looked so loving to everyone else. My mother was so loving, especially to my ne next younger brother. But I couldn't seem to access that love directly to me by what I did or what I didn't do. Um, and so I developed an addiction and I developed obsession. Um, I, uh, I experienced an um, obsession for a girl in school that was a grade older than me at eight years old. I wrote, I love Jennifer on a piece of paper, folded it up, put it in my sock and wore it to school. I don't know, for days until it finally fell out and my best friend picked it up and opened it up and she said, oh, you love her? And she was so angry at me. And um, I felt really embarrassed, you know, that I had been found out, that I had been obsessing on this girl. Well, I didn't know anything that obsession at all. I didn't understand anything at that time. I just knew that for some reason, she was the object of my attention secretly. And um, so that, that, um, that was my first clue that there was something different about me. And then uh, as I grew older, um, at 12 years old, I fell in love with my girlfriend at school who was in my class. And again, this was 
I mean, I came from a very religious family. Everyone's heterosexual. I just knew I loved her, but I didn't know what, what anything about anything. I was pretty, pretty innocent. Um, and so she wouldn't have anything to do with me. Um, she was a nice person, but she was also the most popular girl in school, and I wasn't. And uh, so she ignored me, and I just carried that flame in my heart. I was all set to be the tragic lover. Um, I carried that torch for her for a full year. And then uh, when we became 13 years old and went to high school, um, I ended up telling her about my feelings for her. And she reciprocated, which was a real surprise. But I began a relationship with this girl. Um, and this was in 1968. And um, I can only imagine what might have happened if we had had the opportunity to be innocent and just fumble along in some kind of natural way to discover what, what we might actually feel for each other and grow through it, you know, get, grow up. But instead, um, I experienced a lot of complications. I was found out. Um, I was sent to the school counselor who sent me to the school psychologist and he was a 40 year old man when I was 13. And he began to try to teach me to be heterosexual and teach me about love. And um, what ended up happening is uh, a very, and it's hard for me to talk about it even today after all the work I've done on it, but I became trapped by the school psychologist and um, he began sexually molesting me and uh, I, uh, I, I tried to get out of it, but I was forced to go see him because of my problem. <laughs> so it was a very confusing time for me. And I began to sneak out of my home at night to be with my girlfriend. And um, I got picked up by the police. And uh, that was, again, a very difficult situation. I got in a lot of trouble. Um, but I, I went back to it and started sneaking out again. And... Um, the, the, the second or the third time the police officer picked me up, who's the sergeant of the police force in the town that I lived in, he didn't take me to the, the uh, precinct. He took me to a, a, a rental home that was empty, and uh, he began sexually molesting me with threats. So I was a, a, a young girl in love with my girlfriend, and the adults who could have been helpful to me were not um, I was trapped in a very bad situation. I did not trust my parents because at that point we were not communicating very well with each other. And I started drinking, um, in the religion I was raised in, no drinking allowed. So that was the first thing I went to because, uh, start smoking and drinking to numb out, to cope, to deal with it, which got me in more trouble. So I was quite a victimized child, and um, I developed low self-esteem. I developed deep shame. I felt unlovable, and I compensated for that uh, by creating an even more heroic love story to live out. So I went to the extreme, the grandiosity. And the more I was punished, the greater was my need to willingly die for love. And the more I, I uh, did that and kept reaching out for my girlfriend, the more complicated and difficult my life became. But I didn't really know what real love was. All I knew was that I needed it. And I really needed someone to be there for me as a child. Uh, I eventually couldn't handle it anymore with the uh, school psychologist. At 14 years old, I, I put a note in his window saying that I was going to uh, tell on him. And I asked him to give me some money because I wanted to run away. So I did something awful, but at the same time, I was trying to escape him by asking him to help me escape because my life had become so unmanageable at home. And, uh, and I, 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 I figured that was a solution. Instead, he told the school, I was kicked out of school. He said it was consensual. Um, and my life tumbled into even more despair. My sister came home. My older sister came home for Christmas. I begged her to help me. I told her what was happening. She said, tell our parents. And I said, I can't. 
my father was uh, very cruel to me. And um, he was actually even physically punishing in very brutal ways. Um, it was a very unsafe situation for me at home. And my sister said she couldn't help me and she left back to college. So I was really on my own. And um, to, to, um, to get to fill in the, the, the much bigger story, which some of you know, um, and, and, and just to let you know that it, the outcome of this, within six months of kissing my girlfriend, I ended up in a state mental institution. My parents put me in there based on what the, the psychologist told them to do. And um, I was, uh, it was a state place that was very run down with all the throwaway kids from society. And I was from the suburbs. Um, I had never seen or experienced anything that I experienced in that place. And I was locked in the most uh, severe case ward because I was considered such a risk because I was a lesbian. And uh, I was in there for 15 months. I won't even begin to describe what it was like because it was very horrific. It's very sad to me what happens to children and what happened to me as a child in a place like that. My parents would not get me out. They, they never believed me. So I was pretty much on my own there and I learned how to survive. But it was very difficult and there was a lot of abuse, sexual, a lot of physical abuse, a lot of emotional abuse, a lot of shaming. And... Um, I, I did my best. I stayed more in love. I wrote love poetry. I hid it underneath my, my bed. And I, I stayed addicted to love. I mean, love, my love and sex addiction pulled me through. I had girlfriend after girlfriend in there. I mean, I was such a romantic at that point that um, I got through. And of course, I was considered uncured. So they, they wouldn't let me out. <laughs> but um, my life was pretty bad. And at the same time, a spiritual awakening was beginning in me. Um, I was uh, let out when I was 15 years old under house arrest as an outpatient because I was still not cured. And uh, I was forced to go back to the institution every week until I was 18. So I began a very difficult process, only allowed to go to school and work. I began working full time, saving my money counting the days till I turned 18. All I could imagine is I'm going to be 18 and I'm going to get to be on my own and love who I love and not be punished for it. Unfortunately, the time period when, when it came 18 to 20, um, I didn't pick somebody who was healthy. Of course I didn't because I wasn't healthy and there wasn't a lot of choices. Um, I moved to Chicago I entered an extremely abusive relationship, not immediately. I was with a charming, popular, very fun person to begin with. And then it turned and we both drank too much and it went um, very, very badly for me. So I was in that relationship, unable to get out because I had nowhere to go. I couldn't go back to my parents. I, I, I didn't want to end up in another institution. So I stayed in a very very sick situation, trying to survive, drinking too much, and um, experience uh, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse during that period of time of my life. So pretty much my whole adolescence was a war zone. And it, um, it began a lifelong um, process of needing to heal from very deep trauma. Um, at 20 years old, I I, I thought my only choice was to commit suicide as a way out of that relationship that was so abusive. And I did attempt that. I did uh, suffer very badly from an overdose in coma. Um, and then finally, a full cardiac arrest at 20 years old. Um, I was found and, and taken to the hospital. They did save my life. Um, so thankfully, I got another chance that, that I didn't die in that condition of such abuse and such sad uh, reality from just wanting to love, just searching for love. And um, within, tw within two years, so by 22 years old, I had a spiritual awakening. In that time, a counselor sent me to AA at 20 after this attempt to kill myself. And I couldn't handle it, but it did plant a seed of the 12 steps. So I did, um, 
I did keep that seed in the dark in me. It didn't actually um, it, it, it emerge until um, um, 22 when I had a, a spiritual awakening in nature. So I, instead of going to people and humans, which I had learned to not trust or adults, especially, I turned to nature and the mystical experiences and had them and experienced an incredible healing emotionally. I quit drinking. I quit smoking. I changed my diet. I went through a radical recovery period uh, until I was 24. And, um, but all along I was addicted to relationships. So I got out of the abusive relationship and what I had was serial monogamy. So I, I had a dependent personality and I was relationship addicted. Um, so I, um, I discovered another 12 step program in 1986 that changed my life. That was ACA, which is adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families. And I started working on those original wounds. And I had a lot of them. So um, I had patterns of tragic love, unrequited love, making great sacrifice for love that is not returned. Um, it later turned into tra being a tragic lover. Uh, and I became the healer lover and focused on others to the exclusion of myself and my wants and needs. I got completely lost in codependency and it deepened I learned how to hold a space for others, but no one was holding the space for me in my relationships. And I had to learn how to hold that space for myself. And I'd started to learn that with my 12 step programs and my practices of good health, meditation, prayer, um, being in nature and practicing earth-based spirituality. Um, pain and pleasure got very mixed up in my love response because of all the trauma and abuse in my childhood and in my early childhood, it wired my whole nervous system and my brain to equate love and intimacy with pain and intensity. And uh, it was an unconscious imprint that motivated my compulsivity and my obsession. So I've been addicted to compulsive obsession, either by thinking about how wonderful an experience of intimacy felt or how wonderful it would feel the next time, ruminating on how I lost someone or how I wished I had done something differently, how I was loyal to someone else and betrayed myself and abandoned myself. This obsession takes me out of the present and it causes me to abandon myself and my vital connection with my higher power. And it has happened over and over and over in my life. It is my most persistent addiction. Obsessive and compulsive thoughts and behaviors pumped internal chemicals in my, into my brain. And thanks to the brain studies that they've done, I've learned that I've been addicted since childhood to cortisol with all the danger and excitement that I experienced and oxytocin for love and bonding, that I learned how to push those buttons in myself, create chaos, create excitement, create uh, love. Even if nobody was around me, I was in love. I could, I could fall in love with a, you know, with a dream. In fact, that's how I actually first came out as a lesbian, was in a dream. Uh, I fell in love in a dream. So this all, uh, all comes from a compulsive need to try and control the past and the future. I was trying to heal myself with this obsession. And I didn't know any better. I couldn't have done any better because that's all I knew. And to some extent, it was working for me. But it comes from pushing my will to be done and not trusting my higher power when I'm in obsession. I want to do a little quote now from um, Bill W., who wrote a letter to a friend about emotional sobriety. So even though I had recovered from substance and appeared to be in these nice relationships, I was severely dependent as a person. Bill Wilson writes, suddenly I realized what the matter was. My basic flaw had always been dependence, almost absolute dependence on people, on circumstances to supply me with prestige, security, and the like. Failing to get these things according to my perfectionistic dreams and specifications, I had fought for them, and when defeat came, so did my depression. 
If we examine every disturbance we have, great or small, we will find at the root of it some unhealthy dependence and its consequent demand. Let us, with God's help, continually surrender these hobbling demands. When we can be set free to live and love, we may then be able to gain emotional sobriety. Nowadays, my brain no longer races compulsive, compulsively in either elation, grandiosity, or depression. I have been given a quiet place in bright sunshine. That's from Bill W. And I feel like that's happening in my life because that is my most persistent hook is that dependent personality. My dependency caused me to need to be needed. I have done things that will make someone need me. It takes me away from love because I am unconsciously giving to get. I'm bargaining and working and paying for someone to love me. Reinforcing that does reinforce this inner wound of not being lovable. And I'm in an illusion of control, wrongfully thinking that it will keep me safe. The part of me that tries to control is motivated, motivated by a deeper fear and feeling of being out of control inside myself. Even though I present a very nice image of competence and like I've got it all together on the outside. It's really my shame base that is my core motivation that is secretly push, pushing my cult compulsivity. So now I have to take a breath. This is where the confessions come. This is where we really get deep because this is where I have the power. When I'm a victim, I have absolutely no power. My disease controls me. When I take responsibility for my part in this addiction, I get my power back. I have a choice. So I'm compulsively driven by a deep fear of abandonment. I was terribly abandoned as a child. I was so alone. I desperately wanted someone to rescue me. So I found myself in relationships of someone rescuing me or me rescuing them. But that wasn't really love. When I did that, I contributed and actually guaranteed my own abandonment because my choice was always to choose dominant, controlling, big personality partners that were ultimately love avoidant, while I enacted my version of love addiction trying to attach to them. And we did the whole push, pull, chase, run, and eventually break up. If I really wanted to attach and bond, I would choose someone emotionally available, and we would both be emotionally present and sober and self-aware. We would be responsible for our own interdependency. So that's the problem. And that's um, what's happened in my life in the past. And what the effects of living with these patterns of sex and love addiction, I created absolute wreckage in my relationships. I lost, I lost myself and I had repeating breakups. I had chronic health problems, um, immune system problems, especially and injuries to my body because I wasn't present. I've lost many opportunities in my work. I've experienced financial instability. I've had repetitive loss of my home. Just like I lost it in childhood, it's repeated over and over in uncanny, perpetual ways. I've also had constant chaos and perpetual broken heart. I'm either trying to heal myself or seeking others and my higher power to heal me. But that's the key, the higher power. I've experienced repeated cycles of loss, betrayal, and abandonment. I've gone through brutal and excruciating withdrawal. I've wanted to die because it felt like it would never, ever end. So what's my solution? <laughs> I have to allow my withdrawal to take me through the pain of loss and suffering. I have to go through the necessary remorse for what I did and didn't do that got me here. I have to step away from love that rescues or needs to be rescued. I'm working toward a balance of interdependency now rather than codependence. I have to forgive myself for how I lost and abandoned myself. Um, I mean, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Thank you, Mary. Um, 
how I abandoned myself. Um, I was chasing and trying to hold on to love. I have to love myself and let God love me unconditionally, realizing I could not have done it any differently. If I had the power to do so, I would have done better. So this is a big, big forgiveness, not beating myself up for all that pain. Realizing my powerlessness uh, created unmanageability in my life and allowed me to understand that a power greater than me could help heal and redirect the course of my life. So now I am exercising, giving 100% surrender to my higher power to fill and guide my life. Because when I hold back, even 2%, when I don't trust fully, I fall back into my bucket of dependency and obsession. So I've been simultaneously chasing and running away from love and intimacy all my life. This is an intimacy disorder that got me into this program. When I become still, I can speak and I can listen to my higher power's will for me. I can make myself available and allow things to come instead of chasing. This is the miracle of sexual and emotional sobriety that I'm searching for by working the steps and using the tools of this program. When I came into this program, I became celibate. My sponsor in 2013 told me to stop chasing relationships, stop traveling, stay still and work the program and do the steps. And so I did. I thought it would kill me to be celibate. She wanted me to be celibate, I think, for three months or longer. Well, I stayed celibate for five years. <laughs> trying to surrender my control. It was complicated. I mean, look what happened in my life. I had a lot of work to do. Even though I read and worked the steps, even though I went to meetings and I had a sponsor, I went to conferences, I joined recovery workbook groups, I did service, I seemed to have a better life. As soon as I began dating again, I hit the wall. And it was twice in the last couple of years that I hit that wall dating seriously and trying to control. I had not fully surrendered to my higher power. I thought I had, but when I got in a relationship, those deeper levels of unconscious control that I still hadn't touched, it hadn't touched that trust in a higher power, a power greater than me that could love me and heal my life. So I want to end with a few readings and I think I have time for them. Um, a State of Grace, again, the Daily Meditations, a great book that came out. I've been in this program watching the group that was, <laughs> I used to live in Florida. So um, there was a group of people down there working very hard to get this, and, and, and a lot of them um, working to get this book out. So here's on page 87, top lines. I find it more useful to keep in mind what I call my top line rather than my bottom line. My top line is what I do want for myself my program goals. These things are beginning to happen for me. SLAA basic text, page 270. The distracting influence of addiction leaves undiscovered corners of our life left unexplored. What dreams has our addiction kept us from realizing? What might have done, what might we have done with the weekend spent trolling the internet for porn, the hours spent obsessing about our qualifier? What goals did we let fall by the wayside? Discovery gives us back our lives. We can pick up old hobbies, spend more time with our family, or even return to school to pursue a new field of interest. It helps to have positive goals to strive for. Too much time spent dwelling on not acting out can be intensely frustrating. Rather than constantly striving not to do something, we can place our focus instead on what we can do to better ourselves. Recovery allows us to uncover the bright, talented, and interesting human being we were meant to be. What will we do with our new lease on life? Today, I explore the neglected areas of my life growing mentally, physically, and spiritually. I have a couple more things I'd like to read to you, and that is my top and bottom lines, and then my personal statement of commitment. And I think I have 10 minutes left. Is that right, Mary? Okay, so I think I have time to do that. So let me see if I can find those. Um, so I've been working on top lines. These are nothing like the top lines I came in with in 2013. These have evolved. My top line basics are daily, meditation, creativity, 
nature, humor, education, exercise, loving physical attention. And then I, in, it may include a massage, a bath, hugs with self and others, using my senses consciously with smell, taste, touch, healthy nurturing, and fun food, visual beauty around me or on me, jewelry or a salon, dental and medical care, self-care. Uh, weekly to be with a sponsor or be a sponsor for someone. Go to at least two meetings, SLAA meetings a week. And recently I'm going to 12 12 step meetings a week. This is during the pandemic. Um, read inspirational literature, contact another person in program to share and or listen. My top lines are also to be clear and direct in defining my personal boundaries and then holding to them, even in the presence of extremely effective manipulative seduction on any level of my mind, spirit, or body. To be honest with others and myself, be with people who are mature, secure, and have self-awareness. Be with those who can take responsibility for themselves and give me space and encouragement to take care of myself. Be with others who incite my creativity and inspire my enthusiasm for life. Know what my feelings, wants, and needs are. Use my voice to express my feelings, wants, and needs. Otherwise, I'm abandoning myself to become invisible. Practice worthiness. Treat myself well with respect and love. Expect respect from others. If they disrespect me once, I educate them. Twice, I turn away. If three times, I get going. This is really important for a person who stays too long in relationships. Embrace being alone when loneliness comes. Be present with it. Feel my feelings and express them. Use words, song, journal, art, music, movement, and nature. Whew. So now my bottom lines. My bottom lines include anything or anyone who damages my relationship with myself, threatens my integrity, my relationship with my higher power, pulls me away from my spiritual path, does not bring the best out in me, denigrates my quality of life, my home, my work, my finances, my intuition, and better judgment. My bottom lines include anything or anyone who causes me to be in a rush, to feel desperate, compromise myself in destructive ways, or postpone my own well-being to benefit someone else. My bottom lines include anything or anyone who triggers me to bargain or manipulate someone else emotionally, trying to create dependence and avoid abandonment. I will not continue to engage in anything or with anyone that threatens or frightens my inner children or triggers my dissociation. I'll let go and walk away from anyone who uses me in a way that discards or discredits my preciousness, anyone who undermines my choice and free will. Steer clear of anyone in a personal relationship trying to get me to rescue and caretake them and or rescue and caretake me. So, um, and then um, this is my statement of commitment. (laughs) I'm going to put it out there because it's so important. This, you're witnessing this is helping me to make this real, to bring it into my life even more fully. My personal statement of commitment is I fervently and desperately want to want my recovery from sex and love addiction. I am committed to working this program of of SLAA in order to achieve emotional, sexual, and spiritual sobriety. I want to experience self-love, self-respect, emotional maturity, and spiritual awakening. I can finally imagine having a healthy, balanced, sustainable, intimate relationship free of my patterns of addiction, obsession, fantasy, and projection, tragic romance, and heartbreak. I am no longer willing to continue living a narrative that enslaves me and takes all my hopes, dreams, and my best qualities, turning them into dramas that have nearly destroyed the soul of who I really am and who I'm capable of being. I am writing a new story, one with real love, respect, and dignity. I am embracing joy as I sweep up the pieces of my life. I now choose to surrender not 30%, not not even 98%, 
but 100% to my higher power, trusting my higher power will transform my life and guide me every step from this point onward. So I'd like to close. Some of you will know this prayer. It's on page 63 of AA's big book. It's the third step prayer. So if you want, you can turn on your mic or leave it off. But please um, listen and hear this prayer that um, the creators and the foundation of all 12-step programs wrote. God, I offer myself to I offer myself to build with me and to do with me as I will. I will. Believe me with the bond of yourself that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties the victory over them may bear witness to those that I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May do thy will always. Thank you. Bless.